Hi everyone and welcome. This is an extra story to coincide with the anniversary of the Walls End Colliery Pit disaster that happened on June the 18th, 1835. This is also a remake of an earlier video that I had done and I hope that this is a much better version. I hope you will find this tr sad and tragic story interesting and I thank you very much for watching. Like a lot of the Walls End Colliery disasters, this is one that I had not known about until around 18 years ago. It wasn't something that I was taught at school, which I think is a shame, as local history, to me anyway, is very important. I believe those lost in our colliery disasters should never be forgotten. They were real people, some were even our ancestors, who were just going to work to earn the money to look after their families, not knowing they would never return. The names of those who lost their lives will be read at the end. For the research for this video, I have used information from the Durham Miner Museum, from old newspaper articles, a very old book about the disaster, and also some information from the book about the disaster written by Ken Hutchinson. But of course, this is my interpretation of the story and not a direct copy of any of those sources. On Thursday, June the 18th, 1835, at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, a dreadful explosion took place at Mr. Russell's Colliery in Wall's End. Wall's End Colliery was often also called G Pit or Church Pit or Russell's Old Wall's End. The explosion killed 26 men and 75 boys, leaving numerous widows and 83 children without fathers. The number of men and boys employed at the colliery at this time was around 220, so this was virtually half the workforce. The colliery had been viewed that morning by Mr Atkinson and his son. They were both underviewers and it was after their inspection that they classed it as being in perfect working order. There was no indication of any escape of gas. At the time of the explosion, there was also four overmen and, and deputies down at the mine, all accustomed with working in collieries for upwards of 30 years. This mostly suggests that the appearance of the gas that caused the explosion was sudden and not something that could have been easily avoided. The explosion was described by the banksman as being like an earthquake, with a rushion of choke damp to the mouth of the shaft, bringing up with it some of the pitman's clothes and other light articles from the bottom, which as you can imagine indicates that this was a huge explosion as the bottom was a long way down from the top. Can you imagine it being close to the shaft and seeing people's clothes flying into the air? It must have been horrifying. There were two other shafts connected to this colliery at the time. In one, only two men were at work who said they felt a slight shock and soon after a quantity of choke damp. I believe this is just another name for the gas in the mines. They luckily escaped by being drawn up to the surface immediately and in the third shaft there was no one at work. As soon as the alarm was raised, crowds of wives and other family members gathered at the pit head. It was described as being an awful scene of sorrow. I can't even begin to imagine what it must have felt like to be standing there waiting to find out if your loved ones were going to be rescued, if they were alive or not, and knowing that some of those loved ones were children as young as eight years old and that there was nothing that you could do to help. You could only stand and watch. It must have been dreadful for anyone to witness. The rescue mission began straight away and eight miners volunteered to go down in the hope of being able to save some of their companions. However, John Buddle felt it might not be safe to do so so soon as he felt that some of the gas may still be present and might cause problems for anyone going down into the mine. And he was proved right as after reaching the bottom, the eight miners found themselves to be instantly suffocating with the foul air that was still present at the bottom of the shaft. They had great difficulty getting hold of the ropes and were almost insensible, which would mean they were losing consciousness before they could be drawn back to the surface. Such was the dangerous state of the mine that it was decided that all further attempts would have to be postponed until the following day. 
when it was hoped that the gas would be less dangerous. How can anyone imagine how that must have felt for those gathered at the surface, waiting for news of their loved ones, now having to wait another day to find out if their loved ones were alive or dead? I have to wonder if they remained at the colliery, taking comfort from each other, or did they return home until the rescue mission resumed the next day? On Friday, the efforts were resumed and John Buddle himself was part of the rescue team. John Buddle was always involved in mine rescues. He was the kind of man who would not leave the work for others, which is most likely the reason why he was so well respected in the area. The first 21 miners were recovered that day and none were alive. The work to rescue the remaining miners continued day after day until all the bodies had been recovered and taken to their family homes, all that is apart from one poor boy by the name of Jay Heppel, and he was not found until August the 11th. Very few homes in War's End had been saved from the loss of a loved one, and in some of the houses, fathers and sons lay side by side in what was known as deathbeds, and in others, brothers lay side by side in death, and there they would remain until their burials. The loss felt by the town of War's End was enormous. To the astonishment of everyone connected with the colliery, on Sunday, three and a half days after the explosion, four of the miners were found to be alive. They were immediately brought to the surface with as much care as possible. The poor men could give no clue as to how they had survived, as for some of the time they had been delirious from the gas, and they also had no idea how long they had been underground, not knowing how many days had passed since the explosion, having lost all sense of time. Of the four survivors, three men and one boy, one needed his leg amputated and another was badly burnt, and one of them, John Reed, sadly died on the 3rd of July from his injuries. The scene in the town of War's End on the Monday afternoon was another incredibly distressing and painful sight, with sometimes two and even three bodies being taken from the same houses amid the agonised cries of their remaining families on their way to be buried. The bodies were buried in what I believe were two large trenches in St Peter's churchyard. These would probably have been in a close location to those who had been buried there in 1815 after the heat and main colliery disaster. At the time, the families were asked by the colliery owners if they would like a memorial of some kind, but their need for money for food and a roof over their heads was far more important to them than any monument or headstone would ever be. This sadly left the gravesite unmarked and is still relatively unknown today. 102 miners and 10 or 11 horses were killed in the disaster. Some stories vary on the number of horses killed, and the ages of those who died range from 8 years up to 76. On Monday, June the 22nd, an inquest was held which ran for several days, also on the 23rd, the 25th and again on the 27th, during which time some of the jury visited some of those who had survived the disaster. The inquest was originally opened at John Buddle's office, but was later moved to the larger Wesleyan schoolhouse to allow more people to attend. John Buddle, the viewer and underviewer of War's End Colliery, who had worked there for 43 years, gave some details of the mine to the jury. He stated that there were three downcast shafts and two upcast shafts at the colliery, and he said that the Bencham seam was more difficult to work than the high main. These details, I assume, would help the jury to understand how the colliery worked on a daily basis. He said that two small water cannon were kept at the mine to extinguish, extinguish medium fires and any smaller fires were often put out by just using the men's jackets. Davy lamps had to be used, but there was an idea that the miners might be more tempted to use candles, which it was said provided better light. At the inquest, it seems that the idea that the miners may have used candles was used in a way in which to explain what might have caused the explosion. Miners were also said to light their pipes from the Davy lamps, and it seems this was also mentioned as another option of how the explosion might have happened. In the end, the verdict of the inquest was that of accidental death, 
and the owners of the colliery were not required to pay any compensation to the families whose loved ones had perished. However, a disaster fund was established and William Russell gave 200 guineas and John Buddle gave 20. In terms of today's money, this would have been something in the region of £34,000. Several of the churches in the area also gave money to the fund and the final total was just over £2,000, which today would be around £325,000. This may seem like a lot, but given the number of people who needed money and how long they would need it for, it would not last very long, and in the end it lasted just over six years. Each widow was given £2, and each widow who lost a child over nine years of age was given a weekly allowance of two shillings and sixpence, and one shilling for each child lost who was under the age of nine. William Russell also provided all of the coffins for the funerals and one pounds towards the cost of the funeral for each man and child. I am not sure how long the widows would have been allowed to remain in their homes as some would have been tied to the jobs of their husbands and children. The sad and tragic loss of lives should never be forgotten and with the help of a team of good people who all feel as I do, we will hopefully be restarting our plans for the 1835 memorial soon. This had to be put on hold due to lockdown and other issues. This planned memorial will complement the plaque provided by Wall's End History Society in 1984. For anyone wishing to follow updates for this, you can find us on Facebook under the group name of Wall's End 1835 Project. The following are the names of all those who lost their lives on June 18, 1835. I have taken these names from the Durham Mining Museum page, so please forgive me if any are incorrect, and please do forgive me if I pronounce any incorrectly. Names, ages and individual jobs are included where known. Henry Appleby, age 17, Putter. James Appleby, age 11, Trapper. Edward Bell, age 19, Helper Up. Francis Bell, age 22, Crane Man. Richard Bell, age 19, Putter. Robert Bell, age 13, Rowley Driver. William Bell, age 16, Rowley Driver. Martin Brown, age 33, Hewer. John Buddle, age 19, Putter. Matthew Buddle, age 14, Putter. Michael Buddle, age 17, Putter. John Chicken, age 19, Putter. Robert Clark, age 21, Putter. David Collins, age 19, Putter. Edward Comby, age 22, Putter. Edward Comby, age 12, Rowley Driver. James Comby, age 11. Robert Comby, age 20, Putter. James Cousins, age 20, Putter. William Christa, age 56, Deputy Overman. William Christa, Jr., age 17. John Crosser, age 23, Hewer. Robert Dawson, age 13, Trapper. Bateman Dinning, age 12, Putter. William Dinning, age 17, Putter. Thomas Elrington, age 15, attending Davy Lamps. John English, age 19, Putter. Andrew Giles, age 16, Rowley Driver. Henry Giles, age 21, Putter. James Giles, age 19, Putter. John Giles, age 19, Putter. John Gillis, age 20, Putter. James Green, age 19, Crane Man, Peter Green, age 16, Stone Store, George Hall, aged 11, Putter, John Hall, aged 18, Putter, Joseph Harbottle, aged 72, Trapper, Francis Haxon, aged 14, Trapper, John Heppel, aged 12, Trapper, Thomas Huggup, aged 11, William Johnson, aged 47, Sinker. George Kennedy, aged 16, Rowley Driver. George Kyle, 
age 9, Trapper. Joseph Lawson, age 63, Deputy Overman. John Lowry, age 15, Attending Davy Lamps. Luke Mason, age 19, Potter. Peter Mason, age 17, Potter. Robert Mason, age 13, Trapper. Thomas Mason, age 12, Trapper. William Mason, age 15, Potter. Edward McNay, aged 18, Potter. George Miller, age 16, Potter. James Miller, age 20, Potter. John Miller, age 12, Trapper. James Moore, age 12, Way Cleaner. Thomas Moore, age 14, Helper Up. Christopher Ovington, Junior, age 19, Potter. Krista Ovington Senior, age 67, Doorkeeper. David Patrick, age 15, Trapper. William Patrick, age 17, Trapper. Ralph Pendlington, age 15. Christopher Rate, age 13, Potter. Hutton Rate, aged 18, Potter. Cuthbert Reevely, aged 43, Hewer. John Reevely, aged 12, Trapper. John Reevely, aged 20, Potter. John Reevely, aged 11, Trapper. Thomas Reevely, aged 16, Helper Up. Thomas Reevely, aged 34, Hewer. Andrew Ray, aged 28, Hewer. William Ray, aged 24, Hewer. John Reed, Jr., aged 14, Way Cleaner. John Reed, Sr. Percival Reed, Age 15, Way Cleaner. Andrew Robson, age 12, Trapper. John Robson, age 35, Deputy Overman. Christopher Roseby, age 13, Roly Driver. John Roseby, age 16, Putter. Joseph Roseby, age 10, Putter. Joseph Roseby, age 15, Roly Driver. Robert Roseby, aged 8, Trapper. Roger Sharp, age 19, Potter. Thomas Sharp, age 19, Potter. Thomas Simpson, age 62, Overman. George Salisbury, age 14, Trapper. John Salisbury, age 16, Way Cleaner. Matthew Salisbury, age 31, Onsetter. John Staines, age 20, Potter. Thomas Swan, age 13, Roly Driver. James Thompson, age 13, Driver. John Thompson, age 14, Roly Driver. William Thompson, age 53, Sinker. Matthew Usher, age 12, Trapper. John Waggett, age 21, Putter. John Waggett, age 14, Driver. Ralph Waggett, age 75, Trapper. Ralph Waggett, age 16, Driver. Joseph Wanless, age 10, Trapper. Luke Watson, age 15, Trapper. Robert Wilkinson, age 21, Trapper. William Wilkinson, age 17, Roly Driver. Joseph Wright, age 21, Putter.